In this lecture, I'll talk about higher order partial derivatives and the chain rule. The partial derivatives are also functions of x and y. So you can continue to take derivatives of the partial derivatives, and these are called your higher order partial derivatives. This is the second partial derivative with respect to x, and it's a result of taking the partial with respect to x of the partial with respect to x. And it can be abbreviated f with two x's down here as subscripts. Same for y. The next term, which I have noted incorrectly, it's really f y x, is called the mixed partial. And the mixed partial, you're taking a derivative with respect to x and with respect to y with two different variables or more. Those are called the mixed partials. Here's an example which makes things a little clearer. We have some function of two variables here. Whoops, I thought I had the marker. Two, um, a function of two variables. You can take the first derivative with respect to x, the first partial with respect to x, by considering y to be a constant. So when y is a constant, the derivative of the first term, of course, is 2y sine x cosine x, just using the um, chain rule on the term sine squared x. The next term, you just get cosine y using the product rule for x. Cosine y is considered a constant when you take this derivative. Now you go over and take the derivative with respect to y of the same function. Now x is a constant, or held constant, and you just look at the variation with respect to y, so the first term will give you sine squared x. In the second one, you'll have plus x sine y because cosine y becomes negative sine y, and x is a constant. And now you notice this is a function of x and y. This is a function of x and y. We can continue to take derivatives. When I take the next derivative with respect to x, it means I'm taking this function and taking another x derivative, and I get a ter terms like this. 2y cosine squared x minus 2y sine squared x. Okay. And now I could take this function, dy by dx, uh, I'm sorry, df by dy, and I can take another derivative with respect to y. The first term, of course, is going to vanish because there's no y in it. The second term, I'll end up with x cosine y. So those are my first derivatives. This would could also be noted, f with two y's, and this could also be written as f with two x's. Now for the mixed partial, I start with this term and I take the derivative with respect to y and I get 2 sine x cosine x plus sine y. And now I apply the same rule over here, but now I'm going to take the derivative with respect to x and interestingly enough, this is the same. And it's the same because of continuity of all these variables, all these partials. It doesn't always happen that you get the same results. When it does happen that the mixed partials are the same, that means it did not matter the order in which you took the partial derivative. You could have taken derivative with respect to x first and then taken the derivative with respect to y, or you could take the derivative with respect to y first and then taken the derivative with respect to x. And this result holds if only if all the partial derivatives are continuous. That means all the partial derivatives up to the uh, up to the derivative that you're considering. All of those have to be continuous. And there's a theorem for this. This is Clairaut's theorem. The mixed partial derivatives are equal only when all the partial derivatives, that would be the first with respect to x, the first with respect to y, and then all of them are continuous. And when all these derivatives are continuous, then the mixed partials are the same and it doesn't matter what order you take them. All I'm presenting here is just some of the bare bones in this lecture, uh, bare bones mechanics of how to do these problems. I suggest that if you have time that you look in the book for these chapters and just try to do a whole bunch of the problems. The, some of the first problems are in there. Take a bunch of derivatives with respect to x, a bunch with respect to y. Take some mixed partials, take some second, you know, these higher order derivatives. Um, you know, just with a number of topics that we have to go over in Calculus 3, I can't 
I can't see um, having a whole bunch of problems on this. There are some homework problems for some practice, but you can also use the problems in the book just for learning. Now I will explain the chain rule for these functions of several variables. In fact, the, ch the chain rule and implicit differentiation are exactly the same as for functions of one variable. But when you look at several variables, the chain rule has some geometric significance that's interesting, and also I want to make sure you're, you're aware of the form of it. So what we have here is some function of x, y, and z, but x is actually, um, this is an abuse of notation, x is actually some function of time and y, I want to consider the y values that are some function of time and the z values that are some function of time. Now one way to do this is to find these functions, substitute them into the equation and get one monster equation, all of it would be a function of t. Right? Because we're all going to, it's going to, you're going to end up with some function of time when you're done and then you could take the total derivative of f with respect to t. Remember this is going to be total because there are no other variables. That's a lot of work and error prone in that. Instead there's another way to do this and here's how it's done. You take the derivative of f with respect to x, y, and z. Take these partials just like you would for this function. As though you're considering all values of x, all values of y, and all values of t. Then take the derivative of x with respect to t from this equation y with respect to t from that equation over there, and z with respect to t from this equation down here. Okay, and you can see by the chain rule that does give you your, um, it will give you a total derivative with respect to time. For an example of this geometric significance, let's say that x, y, and z as functions of time describe a helix, and this is in the homework too. So what this means is that somewhere in the space you have some function of x, y, and z. Let's say that's temperature or pressure or some scalar function all over in space or maybe in some range, some room or something like that. Okay, and then you have, you're considering only the x, y, and z that lie along, oh, I thought that was a different color lie along some kind of helix in that space. So you might be looking for the variation of the function as you move in this direction. So you're following the direction of this curve and you're tracing out the derivatives along that curve. You don't care about all space, maybe you only care about this right here and the idea could be that if this is temperature, perhaps this is a wire that's located in some kind of oven and you're interested in the temperature distribution and its changes along the wire. And that's why you would have x, y, and z restricted in that way. It's also possible that you're, um, instead of describing a line, a space curve, x, y, and z are describing a surface. Then they might have two parameters instead of just t, it might be x varying with r and s y varying with r and s, and z also varying with r and s. In this case, you might be looking, for example, if you had the same situation where you had the temperatures, you might be looking for some sort of a, I don't know, some kind of, maybe there's some kind of plate that's sitting in your uh, oven, and you want to know, you want to investigate the changes in temperature along this plate. How's the temperature changing? as I move along this plate, and that's what I'd be looking for. So I would have, now the chain rule is a little more complicated. Again, you have the derivatives of f with respect to x, y, and z, and then you multiply, and now these are going to be partials because you have two variables here, r and s. So you mu multiply by how x changes with r or s, how y changes with r and s, and how G, z changes with r and s. And then you have partial derivatives because 
you have two variables instead of just one as in the previous example. So you have the partial of f with respect to r, the partial of f with respect to s. So let me show you how this would work for a simplified version of what's in the homework. Say so you have a given temperature distribution in some kind of fire or in some kind of oven or some kind of firebox. Okay. And let's say this is the temperature distribution and that's how the temperature varies in x, y, z in, in this box. All right? And now you inside the box you have this helical shaped wire, in this case a radius of 2, and it's um, fairly stretched out because you've got the 10t over here. So here's what the wire inside the box. You're looking for the temperature, the rate of change of temperature along this wire. As I mentioned before, you could substitute all of this into this equation and get one monster equation for T. So that would be 2, 4, okay, get 40 sine T, cosine T, and then it's also being multiplied by T, but I put T out here. Then to find the derivative, you would take the partial, the total derivative of temperature with respect to T, and you'd be taking the derivative of this function. There's nothing the matter with that. In this case, it's actually fairly easy to do. But the other way is to use the chain rule. And here's how you use the chain rule. Okay, I had to go to a new page, so I put this information up here so you could kind of remember it. This is what I want to do. So first I take the derivatives with respect to x, y, and z of this function, as though t does not have any spe uh, special significance. Then I take the derivative of x with respect to t, y with respect to t, and z with respect to t, and that's listed here. Then I combine them into this equation. So now I would have the total derivative of t of temperature with respect to time is yz times 2 cosine t, then I'll have xz times the negative 2 sine t, and xy times 10. You see I just combined them like this. The problem here is that now I've got x's and y's and z's and t's. So to get rid of that, I now substitute from here and end up with an expression that's totally in, has only t in it. It only varies with time. But I don't do that until I've made all the derivatives. And so here's the result. This is what I want to substitute for x, y, and z. Here was the equation I came up with by using the chain rule, but now I have to substitute, and after I substitute in here, now I get the final expression which has only t's in it. And that's how to use the chain rule, and that's how you do that one homework problem.